meet Steve. So it's fantastic to be able to welcome Steve Nardelli here from The Sin, the vocalist from The Sin over all those years. So, hello, Steve. Hi, Kevin. Very nice to be here. Fantastic to have you here. So, although The Sin were originally only in existence for a relatively short time, there have been reunions and up until today, almost as many lineup changes as yes. But <laughs> tell us about those earliest days. What was the first idea of getting a band together all about? So who were your heroes and who did you want to be? Uh, well, the, um, this, the, the sin actually started or came together through uh, a battle of the bands, ah. which mm. was, um, happened at the Ham- Hampstead Country Club, actually. Uh, it was Chris, Squire, Andrew Jackman and their band, which was called The Self, local Kingsbury band. Yeah. And then uh, my band, which was called originally High Court, oh. uh, which yeah. was a sort of rock rock band, uh, blues and rock and uh, rhythm and blues bands, most bands were in those days, and we uh, met each other at this battle of the bands, and the uh, the outcome of it, for whatever reason, was that we amalgamated, and um, that left uh, I took over as singer of the band, uh, Chris on bass, obviously, Andrew Price Jackman keyboards, Martin Edelman, who was with the Selves, he became the drummer. And then my guitarist, a guy called John Painter, he was a guitarist. That was the first lineup of the sin, and that morphed together out of that battle of the bands. I think we were all about fifteen or sixteen yeah. <laughs> in those days. So it was right at the beginning. And and uh, we had mutual heroes, of course, which were the Beatles and that whole sort of um, London, uh, more British rock revolution that was happening at the time. So uh, that's how we came came to be. Our favourite band, I think, from, from all of our points of view, strangely enough, was The Who. Mm. Hmm. They, they, that was a, a great... We used to, they were a local band as well from uh, from Kingsbury and Wembley area. We, we all came from the same area. Uh, we'd often go to see them. Uh, it, they, they'd turn up and play at house. Uh, you know, we was, half of us were still at school then. Uh, so, in fact, the first gig for the sin was actually at my school, right. <laughs> funny enough, uh, Kingsbury County Grammar School at the time. I was doing my A-levels there. And, the yeah, so that that's, that, that was the start of it. We, we just went on from then. But one thing I do remember is, um, even then at 15, how what a brilliant... Uh, bass player Chris Squire was watching watching his band in competition to my band. And he really was a, a bass genius, a, a bass genius, and uh, a musical genius. Mm. And uh, I'm not s- surprised that he's gone on to such iconic status, one of the greatest bass players of all time. Of course, yeah. absolutely. So this is Mark. Hi, Steve. Yeah, hello, Mark. Nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Um, so my question is: over the years. You have worked with many musicians in this sin, and I suppose that the most recognizable names to Yes fans would be Chris Squire collaborator Andrew Price, Jackman, Alan White, Tom Brislin, and Francis Dunnery, originally of It Bites. But tell us about Chris Squire and Peter Banks, who joined way back in 1967, I think. Uh, yes. We have our own impressions of those two characters, but what were they really like back then? Well, I have wonderful memories of them, actually. <laughs> the, uh, what happened with Pete, very soon after we formed the team, with uh, this new uh, lineup of the scene, actual, in actual fact, Peter Banks was a big fan of ours, and he used to come along and watch us. And he was a, a very good guitarist, very into Tamil Motown, a bit avant-garde in those days, yeah. British, in the British, London boys. And he replaced Peter Banks. Uh, Peter Banks, big one. Peter Banks replaced John uh, John Painter. And around that the same kind of time, I know we're talking about uh, Peter, Peter and Chris, but around the same time, we changed drummers as well because my neighbor wanted to go off and get married. He was very, very young in those days. And we replaced him by pure chance with Gunnar Hakan Alsen, an Icelandic drummer, who was an absolutely brilliant drummer. Absolutely brilliant. And would have been a, the drummer for yes, if not for problems he had, uh, personal problems, which meant he, he, he couldn't... Uh, he couldn't take that, that position up. This was after Bill Bruford had left. I know that he was number one choice for right. for, for, for yes. To uh, oh. Although Alan, 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 White, Alan White became uh, the drummer and the rest is history, of course. Yeah. But the uh, but I underestimate how good this guy, Gunnar Nelson was. He was an unbelievable drummer. And we got him as well. That was the classic lineup there. So it included Peter and Chris, obviously. Chris is was a great raconteur. He, he, he was... Um, very, very bright, incredibly bright, and a uh, very intelligent person indeed. 
great sense of humour. And he, he, me and him were very good friends within the band. So in the band, even you have friends within the band. And Chris and I were best friends within the band. But we'd always be going out together and, you know, meeting girls at clubs and stuff. And, <laughs> And going to see other bands and all that stuff. He, so we were we were real good friends, and and I became very good friends with his family as well. Um, actually, uh, very good friends. And the, I think Peter was uh, a little bit different because he was uh, he wasn't actually he came from Barnet, and we were from Kingsbury. He was North London boy though, so that was all right. But he he was different to us, and he was in some ways, and um, he was quite shy and intense type of person. But a, a great guitarist. Uh, I think an under, under, uh, underestimated guitar, uh, undervalued guitarist in many ways. He doesn't. People always think of Steve Howe, but even Steve Howe admits what a, a great impact he had mm. on Yes, and it actually had a great impact on Sin. A lot of uh, those guitar riffs that, that uh, you hear, and, and, and just on the, on, the, on the stuff we did. Although we did, I did uh, some uh, tracks with him in 2003 as well, which yeah. were on the original, uh, the original Sin CD. He was a great guitarist. He was quite an intense person. He wasn't an easy person to get on with, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But um, which is when it, which is why I probably kept having uh, fallouts with bands. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a, a very talented, incredibly talented person. I only have good memories of him, very good memories. I just wanted to ask you, was it because he had uh, strong opinions of the music that he was, was he kind of like butting heads musically? Is that why it was hard to deal with Peter? No, I think he, uh, that part of it, he was very intense about his music and he, he knew, you know, what direction he, want, he wanted to go in. And a lot of the tracks which... Uh, you know, we, did, we saw it as a cover band, but a lot of the covers were, were tracks that he found, mm -hmm. you know, stuff we'd never even heard of. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, that's a great track, let's do that then. And that helped us a lot, actually. So, in actual fact, in the early days, his input, his, his musical input was very significant to the set in that he would find these great tracks. We would, you know, mainly Tamla, Tamla or, you know, uh, uh, American blues, blues tracks, uh, like Bobby Band and you know stuff like that, and he he was uh, yeah, we, and he he really uh, was the guy who who dro drove that in the early days, mm -hmm. and we be, we became because we had these great harmonies with Chris and and Andrew who had, had been the choir boys. Mm -hmm. With, uh, and, and they've been very good choir boys as well. Very high, they were, uh, they were at the Guildford Cathedral, which is a very elite set of choristers. To, to get, become a choir boy at the Guildford, Guildford Cathedral, you have to be really good. Mm. <laughs> and you can hear it in their vocals anyway. But they, and they lived almost next door to each other, by the way. They, they, they knew each other since they were you know, babies, sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and they were very, very close friends indeed as well, of course. With Peter, he, he, you know, he was, he was, it was difficult. Really. I think he was a, a quite intense personality. Yeah. But he, you know, he, he uh, it's partly it came through in the music, came through in, in his personality as well. Uh, there's always a little bit of friction with, with Peter. Yeah. It's not a bad thing, not a bad thing in a band. He was a very nice guy, a very nice person, don't get me wrong. <laughs> he was very nice. You know, I have, I have great memories. We, we went, uh, we, we had this gig for a month in the uh, the Valbonne Club in, in Saint Tropez, and uh, sitting in Cannes, rather, sorry, we went on to Saint Tropez. We had to get down there, the three of us, me, Andrew, and Peter, and I had to borrow my uncle's. Uh, Huge Chevrolet, those big old Chevrolets, you know, from the 50s. Yeah. We loaded up a load of gear in the back of my Chevrolet, and the three of us, and we drove down there when there were no motor, there were no motorways in those days. Right. It was great. We, and then we ended up, we had number one in France school, so we, were, we spent a lot of time in France. But, the, uh, you know, I have, great, I have great memories of Peter and Chris, but we're very particularly close to Chris because we were very similar in many ways. Mm -hmm. My memories of them are, are very good ones. So, obviously, Chris is legendary for being <laughs> late to rehearsals and those sorts of things is that something which started off right with the from the from the the word go with the sin yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's, he keeps his own times and when we were making it's indestructible i, I used to go and pick it up i was speaking to steve hackey about this when they met with his, he was doing his thing uh, we'd always start a recording about two o'clock in the afternoon yeah. because chris doesn't get up till two o'clock in the afternoon that's the problem <laughs> so i would pick him up at one from his hotel if i didn't pick him up he probably wouldn't get there till five o'clock yeah and we would head off to the, to the studio. He, he, he keeps different times. He yeah. tends to be he'd be up all night and, and then sleep, you know, in the mornings. And then he, he was a, a very bad timekeeping. We did one show in Cardiff, I remember, where he was in Cardiff with us, but unfortunately never showed up for the gig. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was quite funny, actually. It's, it's quite a funny story because this is uh, we're going back a long time ago. Now. It's Cardiff. It was a ballroom in Cardiff, a nice venue, actually. 
and uh, uh, he never showed up, so we had to do it without it. The, there was a guy who worked at the club. He said, he said look, you know, if you need a place to do a touring around Wales at the time, you no, know, you can stay at my stay at my my flat, and I'm, I'll stay with my mum. So you've got a place to stay, you guys. It was really oh, nice of him. Yeah. His mm. name was Tom. His name was Tom Jones. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he went on to be quite quite successful. Quite quite successful. <laughs> yeah. Very nice of him, though. Very nice of him. We we slept in his flats, and Chris was there. He was there. He was at the flats. Oh, but he, never, he wasn't at the gig, though. So he was. Uh, <laughs> he, he was notoriously late. He's famous, and and whenever you know, you probably heard even when he in the yes days the arguments about like everybody's waiting, you know, with their tour, the tour manager to. To head out to, to get get the next plane, and they're waiting and waiting. <laughs> I don't know. He had this magic. He was magic because he, he would always appear incredibly late, but always be on time, just in time to get the plane, or just in time to get you know what I mean, the train or whatever it was, or, or to get on stage. Yeah. I don't think time. He was not in that. He was in his own time zone. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I didn't mind actually. I didn't mind because that's, that's that was part of his personality. Yes. Yes. Could be frustrating. I can understand it could be frustrating. Though. Yes. So um, tell us a bit about. Then the music, then because you you actually moved it, shifted the music, the style of the music, didn't you, into a sort of more psychedelic sound on songs like Flower Man and Fourteen yeah. Hour Technical, a Dream. So why was that shift? What was the reason for that shift? Well, I think it was a, it was a movement within the London scene. We were we were we were based at the Marquee Club. We played there every week. Mm. We played there more times than any other band in its history. It was like a village, really. That that scene. So we would hang out the the, the Giaconda in the in the uh, mornings at lunchtime. Is on lunchtime is uh, in Denmark Street, Timper and Alley, they, they called it in those days. I think probably uh, it's where all the music publishers used to be. There was this, this uh, restaurant there, the, like a coffee bar called the Giaconda. Mm. We'd hang out there with Cat Stevens, David Bowie, uh, all the all the London guys, you know, uh, the rock guys who were just starting them. We'd discuss things and it was like a catalyst of, of musicians. Mm. Well, I was just talking about this with someone recently, actually, this week mm. um, <laughs> uh, actually about how you get uh, areas where groups of art artists come together it yeah. could be any, any any of the creative arts it becomes a catalyst for a new genre yeah. mm-hmm. From an area, so you say, oh, you know, the, the, the London scene, you know, yeah, that, the London sound started there in London, you know, in Soho or whatever, and and that that was true of that that era of British music, for London music particularly, and there was the influences. And of course, being at the Marquee, which is absolutely was the mecca of of the music of all the top, you had to be the, only the best bands were the Marquee. It was a, it was a great um, badge of honour if you played there yeah. so, <laughs> for musicians, and we were we were there every week. Also, a support band initially to all the big groups of the day. So we means we played with Pink Floyd, we played with Spencer Davis Group, uh, we played with Progo Harmer, Harum or the uh, the Moody Blues, mm-hmm. all the big bands of that day. Cat Stevens even actually was a good friend of mine. Cat Stevens, and then and then of course most famously we played with Jimi Hendrix. So t- tell us about that night. What what was that like? We turned up. We'd been up north. We turned up down for the marquee uh, to, to set up. When we got there. These three guys were there. I knew uh, Mitch Mitchell already. He was, I, knew, I knew him quite well. And we wonder, they don't normally allow people, the bands to rehearse on the marquee. But these guys were rehearsing. <laughs> and um, we didn't know who they were. We thought they were, because we were expecting to play a band called Cliff, Rebel, uh, Cliff, Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers, mm. who currently had a number one record with um, Got to Get You Out of My Life, which is, or Into My Life, or out, out or Into It. <laughs> So it's not, I know it was number one in the charts, a Beatles song, actually. Mm. And uh, we said to the manager, what's going on? And he said, oh, no, these guys these guys have a, the head back, the, the line, the, the main band tonight. Mm. So, yeah, well, who are they? <laughs> so um, <laughs> what had happened, where we'd, we'd been out of town, but what had happened is that Chaz Chandler had brought Hendrix over. He'd seen Hendrix in New York. And brought him over. He was with Robert. The Chess Yard was with Robert Stigler's organisation, and he brought them over to England. That literally those those, those last few days, he got Hendrix to a couple of musicians, Mitch Mitchell and uh, Noel Redding. Noel Redding was a lead guitarist, but they switched him to bass because obviously yeah. Jimmy mm-hmm. Hendrix wasn't bad at lead guitar. <laughs> 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 um, and they were literally rehearsing. They'd never played it before, yeah. and they were rehearsing what they were going to play. Right, huh. and, it, um, <laughs> and it really happened happened like that and, and what happened is because, because Chas Chard and the, the Stigwood organisation they'd ran, ran round to all the 
the musicians like the Beatles, you know, the Stones, all the people they knew said, look, there's this great guy coming in from New York. And the Marquis might come down. Yeah. And they all came. <laughs> and, and they all came. So when when the audience was the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who, yeah. you know, Eric Clapton, uh, Jimmy Page, there were everybody who was anybody in the uh, in the British, it, London watching certainly, in that, that time was in the audience, all of them. And yeah. the Beatles were literally sitting in front, they were like, what, two feet from me. At the front of the stage, they were first row, the four of them. These are my absolute heroes, by the way. I was 16, 17, I was in 17. Then. And what happened, it was an unusual night because, and it was big, you know, they, 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 in those days, the market could hold a 1,000, hmm. and apparently there were 1,400 people in there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It would be illegal today. The people would be arrested today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Health and safety would be all over it. But it was it was bursting. It was. Yeah. And it was absolutely bursting. <laughs> and and um, we well it was, we couldn't get out the the, the, um, the dressing rooms. You couldn't get out. We were locked in the. You couldn't get out. It was the, the people were, were, were wedged against the doors. You couldn't get out. Mm. But the, the interesting thing was because they only had about half an hour's worth of material. Because they've been, you know, um, you know, just been practicing. Yeah. They said that we had to do two sets. So we and before they came on, oh. and then they would come on right at the end. So we had to go out, and obviously everyone was excited to see this new guy. It was exciting. Uh, we had to go out and do open do forty five minutes. Yeah. And we we were quite we were we were a good band, very good band. I have to say myself, we were a good live band. Yeah. And with a good reputation, we had our own sort of fan base around the Marquee Club, particularly. So we, but then we had to go off, have a 10-minute break, when normally the, the main band would come on. Yes. And then we would come back on again. So, <laughs> so, and we kind of apologised. We were like, sorry, I know you're waiting. <laughs> we, you know, we, we, we've been ordered to do two sets in a row. Yeah. So, uh, it was, it, but it was all a bit strange, you know, because I've never, never this ever happened before in the history of the marquee. Anyway, we did. We, we did. It was a great, it was, it was great. It was fantastic. The atmosphere was electric. Mm. God knows what the heat was. It must have been 200 degrees because yeah. there's no air conditioning like that. And the, mm. the you know, it was running down the wall. It was a, it was a, a surreal in many ways. And anyway, we we finished. We went off, and we couldn't. We couldn't. We were interested as interested as everybody else to see who this guy was. Yeah. So we couldn't get out of the change room or anything. So we sat on the stage, at the, at the side of the stage, so we could watch this guy. And of course, <laughs> he, he blew everybody away. It was unbelievable. And in the short set that he did, he must have been on. Uh, I'm on for about 45 minutes, I guess. Yeah. They, they say in rock history that was the night that the way the electric guitar, you know, electric guitar pl was played changed. Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because all the key guys that you know, the the, the rock the, the guitar heroes were there. You know, yeah. Cl uh, Clapton, uh, yeah. Jimmy Page, all those guys. They're, they're all there. You know, and and they, they, his influence. Uh, well, I think Hendrix influence lives today as well. Of course. I'm interested to ask you something, Steve. Though on buses, there's something about the game gangster and the flower man rock operas what yeah. what were they when we when we we actually after the, we this these tuesday nights as support band it was to build up an audience because we were playing obviously playing big audiences because we were playing to with the the main bands of the day we get our own night to the marquee and we decided to launch it by doing this um creating these operas now we're the first people the first band that ever did that mm. we beat the who to do this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, people always, always, people always think of Tommy, and you know, Tommy's brilliant. Of course, we're the first, and uh, uh, to my knowledge, we, we looked into it. We always, we always said, we always said it that actually created an opera, a, mm. a rock opera. We started with a gangster one, and we had all these clothes, gangster clothes made, and so we were these like outfits. And I wrote, I, I wrote it with uh, Andrew. Yeah. And he wrote this whole story line, and it was very, very successful. So we did the first, our first forty-five minute set. We would do. Uh, material songs, mm. you know, track, you know, just normal, not normal uh, sort yeah. of session. And then the second part, we do the opera, mm. uh, and it became uh, a lot of, so successful that we then decided to do a follow-up opera, <laughs> and, uh, which, which, which is the Flower Man opera. It was much better, better constructed because we were learning. Yeah, and the centre of that was Flower Man. Yeah. On Flower Man, which was very successful, it was a big chart success for us, and uh, as well. So that was good. Uh, it was a good. It was a good time for us. And, and of course, at that time, it was also morphing into the psychedelic era era in London. Hmm. 
all these psychedelic clubs were starting to open up and the music with the Pink Floyd thing with Pink Floyd with their uh, light shows and all that stuff. And that, that whole thing would come, was changing then and that was, and we were changing with it. So I'm interested in that then. So these rock operas that you did, was there any longer form music in them? I'm just thinking maybe that, you know, that's, that then grew into some of the more progressive uh, music a bit later. Well, I think there was because Andrew Price Jackman was, was classically trained musician. Yeah, yeah and he would, con- he, he would construct these whole musical concepts around everything. Yeah. I, I was almost thinking he was the godfather. <laughs> he was, a, he was a, the, the great, you know, the godfather of rock, rock music. Because he, he was light years ahead of other people. He had brilliant ideas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the leader, musical leader in our band. And uh, Chris stayed close to him all his life. Yes, yes. actually, yeah. With uh, did a the Fish Out of Water album was uh, was half Andrew and half half Chris. And that is very much Fish Out of Water is like a sin album. That is, yeah. that is what Sin would have done on. Uh, which is why, funny enough, I don't know if you read the review in the latest uh, review of Sin Destructible vinyl by um, Sid Smith. It's yeah. the it's in in uh, in classic rock this week uh, or this month when he says that the um, Sin Destructible like the follow-up to Fish Out of Water. Very much a Sin album. And the, as the influence of, of, obviously, Chris, of course, but also that musical influence that, that Andrew brings to it. Although he's not obviously on Sin Destructible, but we, a lot of what is in Sin Destructible is influenced by the Sin history of Andrew with, and uh, the, the uh, musician Gerard Johnson who plays on that album. Yeah. Also a great uh, musician, classically trained as well. He took a lot of the influences of, of that uh, of Andrew with, with, with him into that album, which I think is why that album is also a very good album. Absolutely. But uh, right back in 1967 then, the, the Sin split up and Squire and Banks joined Mabel Greer's toy shop and that morphed into Yes and all that. But what, yes. what, what did you do when the band split up? Well, it was me that split the band up, unfortunately, but the uh, <laughs> right. I, I was very interested in... in uh, they, that was a swinging, what they call the swinging 60s mm. <laughs> in London. A very famous time but when the whole London scene became like the centre of the fashion world yeah. in clothing, in music, in uh, London was the fashion city of the world. And I, I met up with you know so the guy actually, um, a guy called Ian Ross, who's Ross Frozen Foods family. Right. We decided to open a load of uh, fashion stores, and uh, and we opened a couple in Kings Road, Chelsea, and I, well, we had one in. Church Street, Kensington, and I got absorbed into that. And I couldn't, didn't have a time to do both. So, yeah, we, I think, we, you know, I didn't exactly walk out in the band, but it kind of just, it just sort of fizzled out mm. in a way. And and then um, Chris and Peter, I think Chris went into hiding for a year, and then reappeared, and and they started putting together this Mabel Gears toy shop. Hmm. He asked me to join that band, Chris. Right. He asked me to join Yes three times, you know. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> he was desperate for me to join Yes. <laughs> uh, but I said, but I said, no, I said, even as, as, as recently as 2004. Right. And I said, no chance. <laughs> Uh, I said, because <laughs> I'm, I'm a singer of the Sin, and your singer is John Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, you're not going to be Yes if you've got me singing for you. So. Right. We were very good friends, actually. I think it's partly that as well. But he also he liked my songwriting as well. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, Steve. Um, so obviously there was you know quite a few years where you were not doing too much musically, but then in 2003 there was a reunion of the Sin. So how did that come about? Well, I never stopped writing actually, and I'd been I I, I always being asked to get involved in musical projects, some strange ones as well. <laughs> so for example, Andrew and I worked with Andrew and Chris going forward around the time of Fish Out of Water. We were working together on stuff all the time, right. uh, mm-hmm. and for example, we did. Um, Andrew and I wrote for the, the these tracks for Rupert the Bear. Do you know who he is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've heard of him here in Canada, but I'm not too familiar <laughs> with it. Well, he's a famous 1930s cartoon character from the Daily Express. Yeah. We, we, Warner Brothers, well, in fact, I, I picked up the rights to the music to Rupert the Bear, and Warner Brothers gave us a contract to make to do these tracks, and we did them. Huh? So with that, I did um, stuff, I did an album with Denise Van Outen, who's a famous, very famous, uh, she's actually got a great voice, but she's a very famous woman, in, in the, well known in the UK yeah. as a radio presenter, and, and actually she starred in um, Chicago on, yeah. on uh, Broadway as well, yeah. she's, a great, oh, yeah. she's got a great voice actually. 
Mm. They were actually a very nice person as well. Mm. And 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 I did uh, stuff like John Miles did music. Remember that song, Music? It was a big, big number. So, so he was working with Alan Parsons at the time. And mm. I did uh, a load of tracks with Decker with them. I was a singer and they were my band. Right, right. <laughs> so I had Alan Parsons doing my arrangements. And and uh, I still still in touch with those guys, funny enough. And so I was, I was always being asked to do stuff, and I was always writing stuff, anyway. So I've I've written. I even did a song for the singer for ABBA. Oh, right. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. The uh, the blonde girl. I can't remember what her name is. Anita. Anita. Yeah. Yes. Yeah called um, Something Happened to Me was the name of the song mm-hmm. and the uh, it came out it was just released and uh, I still get roles this <laughs> mm. from that. that's uh, great yeah no, so I did I wrote a lot of songs and I had a good reputation as, as a writer and, uh, so I was always been, I was very busy in my business I was very successful in my business yeah. and you know even today you know I'm building the, the flagship Eco Town you know in, in Bistler yes it's a, a government flagship <laughs> and I created great. it and, I, my, and uh, I'm building it it's a Two billion pound project. So I, I, I'm still very much in. You know, I've got my business hat and I got my music hat, and it, it, it's very different. My music fans always think I should just be making music all day long. Yeah. So, Steve, um, yeah. during the reunion time of 2003, wasn't Peter Banks initially involved in that reunion? Yes. Yes. Uh, what happened was, I beg your pardon, I, I didn't answer your question. But <laughs> <laughs> I was a complete tangent. Uh, no. Yeah. What happened was actually what the catalyst to that was uh, Andrew Price. Jackman died, mm. and he was uh, it affected us all. It affected me badly, very badly. He was a good friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. We wrote a lot of stuff together, and they, we, you know, that whole history of the funny thing you say we, we were relatively two or three years as a band, the sim. But when you're 18, two or three years is a long time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, it seems like a, a lifetime. So, and I stayed in touch with Andrew right the way through. We were always friends with Chris as well. We were Chris and I. We never lost contact. It was a terrible shock to me and Chris when he died. I did an interview with um, Henry Potts. His, oh, yeah. He's got this Bonders Gazoo yes. site, excellent site. Yeah. Yes, amazing, actually. You, you probably know it. It's, yeah. it's, he updates it on, on a regular basis, and it's, 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 he's very up to speed on it. But, so I did an interview for him, and, and Martin had done an interview for him, and so I, I got in touch with Martin. I hadn't seen him for many years. And I said, you know, we should do something for you know to as a sin to commemorate in, right. in memory of Andrew, you yeah. know, because there's a lots of tracks which are never released and we should just do it. And I was able to get in contact with Peter, who lived, was still living in, in, where he always, always lived, actually. He came over to my house and we, we started work, mucking about and working on... The idea was we do some new tr- some new tracks and have some of the old ones. This is the yeah. original Tin album, the double C D and and um, and it was dedicated to Andrew and that's that's how that came about. But from that we did three new tracks. One which Peter wanted to do, which was the link between us and the S, which was this time and a word. Mm. He'd been on mm-hmm. the original time and a word. He wanted to do a new version of it. Yeah. So we did this like fifteen minute version of it. Yes. If you've heard it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we did we re- did a remake of Grounded, and uh, we did another track which the Sin did, which never recorded called Illusion, and we we, we rebuilt that, <clears throat> and that's but we and we did it at the um, a friend of mine's studio, the Paul Stacey's studio uh, yeah. in Clapham. That's that's mm-hmm. where we did, it. and and out of that the whole thing built up, and then uh, Chris. I'd met up with Chris in Colorado, uh, Red Rocks, and we'd done some interviews together there, I remember. And then, and then he was coming to London to do the, um, uh, it actually was a Trevor Horn Prince's Trust show. Yes. And so he, I said, well, look, while you're here, we, we're working on this 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 track. Why don't, can you play on it? You know, and he said, yeah. And then when he was over here, we spent a lot of time together. We started to write together again. It was great. And we ended up writing It's Indestructible. Right. So we were written this album. We've got, We've got Gerard, we've got the uh, Jeremy Stacey and Paul Stacey, who we've got to know. Yes. Yeah, and we decided to make to, to make the album. And, and uh, we made some demos, and we liked the demos, and, and it went from there. The uh, unfortunate thing was that the that they didn't include Peter. Yeah. It's, uh, there were reasons for that, but the I think it's best if they stay private. Yeah. <laughs> it's history now and in, in respect to him. And uh, he can't he can't, can't answer. But but it, it was which was sad because I'd have liked him to play. I would have liked yeah. him to play. Yeah, of course. But, or in some way to be featured on it. But uh, unfortunately that didn't happen. But we, we created this the this album, it's indestructible. And the twentieth century guitar magazine, we made it Robert Silverstein is a famous prog journalist you may know, uh, he he said he said this is the greatest prog prog album of the twenty first century. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
And Chris said to that, we were doing an interview in uh, LA, and uh, Chris's answer to that was, yeah, but the centre is only six years old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, was, I just remember that but very well. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it's got like, iconic status, and uh, it really has. And, uh, you know, people always, yeah, and I'm very proud of it. Tell us about the re-release. Why has it been re-released now, and, and what's the difference in the, re- in the re-release? Well, it never came out on vinyl originally. Mm. Vinyl has made a comeback. I was introduced to Chris Topham, who's an amazing guy. Uh, he's a Virgin Airline pilot, whichever <laughs> plain groovy comes from, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but and he's got this label which is exclusively vinyl and and it, it's just brilliant and uh, he uh he released uh, Trust Worked on vinyl for us uh, and was very keen to also to do Sindestructible. I thought it would it would be an obvious uh, an obvious album that lent itself to being on vinyl. Hmm. And I got um, the chap who mastered the last couple of albums I've worked and did, a guy called Jer- Jeremy Carroll, and he spent, we spent about a year doing it, a hmm. year to prepare it. No, no, really. It was, you know, we had a, a lot of problems with it. Hmm. Uh, he, uh, he almost had to take, take it back to the, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this kind of stuff, but he explained exactly what he did, but he went back to the raw status and rebuilt it. Again, according to Sid Smith, who's, uh, whose opinion I, I, I hold very highly, yeah. he said, it's such a brilliant sounding album on vinyl. It's almost like this great album, this follow up to Fish Out of Water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's found its true home on vinyl. Yeah. One, one thing I noticed is that uh, that plain groovy records that you mentioned, one of my friends actually had one of his singles released through that gentleman. So it was fascinating that you mentioned that label. One thing I wanted to ask, though, about is a. Uh, one of the more obscure parts of Yes history was the tour, which never happened, that uh, was widely publicized, the More Drama Tour in August yes. of 2005. The cinema is supposed to be part of that. Can you tell us what was really planned around that time? Yeah, yeah. We were, Chris and I were the catalyst of that, that, that tour. We had uh, the idea at that time had been that we, that was the, the sin, because we had Sin Destructible. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was, the Yes band was on a kind of hiatus at the time. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't uh, they they hadn't been playing for for a while and th- there was um, there was us there was Alan White had got his band in Seattle yep. and create and uh, and brought out an album called the called White very good album as well yeah. and then um, the idea was the two bands would play Steve Howe would do a solo part in the middle of it all mm-hmm. and then we would all join together and Chris got, would have got his way because I've had to sing, like, sing the lead parts on the t- on all the yes the yes music to end it with yes so, yeah, uh, and it was from drama which is why they called it the more drama to it which was a, a, a name which they said it was only drama tracks tracks that John Anderson only yes songs that John Anderson hadn't done yeah mm-hmm. right so, uh, and uh, we'd rehearsed them all and everything and we were ready we were on a weekend rehearsals and I'd brought Francis Dunnery in to play in that band. Gary Husband on drums, very good, a very famous drummer. Do you know him? Yes. He's a very, very fantastic drummer, nice guy too. And Gerard Johnson on keyboards. And we've been rehearsing for uh, about a week. And then they, this terrible terrorist atrocities, atrocity in, uh, on the on the in London uh, transport systems yeah. mm. happened. Uh, I think killing 53 people was a terrible in London, and and uh, and overnight the the American security services it basically put up a, a wall that says you know when no one comes in till we can check them out. Mm-hmm. Nobody comes into America from England, and unfortunately they they were checking on every, everybody to see if they uh, anybody with the slightest problem, mm-hmm. the slightest problem. Like they overstayed their visa by a couple of days, which unfortunately Steve Howe had done. Wow. Mm. They wouldn't let them in. Yeah. Wow. So something as innocuous as that, it got blocked. So we couldn't go. So we were delayed trying to sort it out. And of course, the tour was then due to start. Yeah. So the dates were ticking down then. We were cancelling dates every night. Yeah. And it reached a point where the promoter said, no, this, we can't forget it. We've got to cancel it. And they pulled the plug on it, right? Which was sad because I think that would have been a great tour. Yes, yes, uh, it's a fantastic idea. I think. Yeah, that's what happened, and uh, no one was to blame. It was just uh, uh, circumstances outside of our control. Yeah, let's just talk about one more um, version of the the sin, which was the one featuring Tom Brislin and 
Francis Dunnery, and in fact you recorded the album Big Sky in 2009. Was that a, a great set of musicians to work with? Yeah, yes it was. D- Dunnery is a... They always said that Dunnery was going to be with next Steve Howe. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he is a fantastic guitarist, but he's also a fantastic um, all, all-round musician. Yeah. But but he's also got um, you know a great melodic head to it, musical head. Yeah. A bit like me, actually. He says because we're Catholics. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... Uh, he always seems to say, what made the Beatles so great is you got a Catholic, the Catholic melody of McCartney, yeah. and then the Dower Lennon Protestant. <laughs> so, and so you got a Dower, and you put those two together, and yeah. you get to be that wonderful Beatles music. Ah. So, uh, so he was very similar to me. So, and uh, together we we wrote they wrote the song. It was fantastic, actually. Uh, he's got a great house up in the Pinocchio, the mountains. Is it the Pinocchio? No, it can't be the Pinocchio mountains. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Pinocchio. <laughs> Pocono, <laughs> the Pocono Mountains, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Pocono, correct, and, yeah. and it was a lovely, lovely area right on the Delaware Gap around there, you know, right, it's a lovely part of America, mm. and uh, so we we recorded it, we rehearsed up there, we recorded it up there, and uh, I had many fantastic weeks up there doing that. It was I loved it up there, and, and uh, yeah, and I brought in. Um, I always wanted to. I've always been a great fan of Tom Brislin, yeah. was quite a wonderful keyboard player, Absolutely. you know, uh, yeah. so shaped, yes, as well. Mm-hmm. So I like the Yes Connection and, and met Tom and uh, asked him to to come come and play on that album, which he did. Yeah. And then I was using a studio in Philadelphia to do the you know the the main recording, and that, that was owned by Brett Brett Cole from uh, Echolin. Mm. Oh, okay. You know, I don't even you know that band. So, yes, I do. Yeah, so a great, again, a great musician, a great musical head. And, and he, he brought, we needed a drummer, so we, we brought in some drummers. We couldn't find the drummer we liked. And he suggested we use the Eklund drummer, mm-hmm. uh, Paul Ramsey. Mm-hmm. Another great drummer. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, immediately we, you, know, you just know when they start playing whether they're any good or not, so, or whether they're right. <laughs> yeah. What you're doing, and so perfect. And uh, so we had Paul and, and Brett from Eckelin and uh, the guys um, Francis and, and Tom. It was a great lineup. It was a great lineup. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of fun as well. A lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You, you know that we did some touring and we played at Rosfest and that yes. was recorded at Rosfest so we had the Big Sky album which was voted the best prog album of 2009 yeah. by USA Prog uh, magazine which was amazing mm. cool. but then we also had a live album the Sin Live at Rosfest or something like that the Sin mm. Rosfest you know <laughs> when we did the Rosfest show yeah. which is also the same lineup the same lineup live so let's let's bring this up to date so what does the Sin consist of now today and what are your plans well, we made uh, another album called Trustworks, which was yeah. about six years in the making because the guys I made it with was Moon Safari, who were a band based in the far north of Sweden in yeah. a place called Skelleftia, mm-hmm. which is right in the far north of Sweden in a very beautiful part of the world uh, with the northern lights and all that stuff <laughs> to keep you company <laughs> uh, at this time of year because there's, there's no daylight. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we um, what I liked about them is they played at Rosfest with us. Mm. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about them is they've, they've got these brilliant, brilliant singers. Because yes. I, I actually, the, the the Swedes are very melodic. If you listen to the way they talk, and they've got a lot of melody. It's in their blood. Yeah, and they've got these great. They do these great harmonies and very melodic way of, of stuff. And they've got some some great, some wonderful talent. In, 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 they're a wonderfully talent, talented band. Mm. Great uh, musicians. Are great. The, the, their guitarist, a guy called. Pontus Atkinson, the three brothers actually, what Pontus is one of my favourite all time guitarists. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I really, yeah, the, the, uh, I don't know if you've heard it's indestructible, but he plays a guitar solo which uh, ends that album. Oh, right. Which is, uh, oh. it's, people say it's the best album, best guitar solo of all time. Right, right. Well, I've <laughs> listened to it. So, like, some DJs have said that, and, uh, you know, I kind of agree with them. It's one of the best. If yes. you, you know, bearing in mind, like every note was, it wasn't an ad lib guitar solo. Yeah. It was it was structured almost as a classical piece. Right. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing guitar solo. The great thing about that album was I just wanted to, at the end of the album, with six years in the making, I just felt we needed a producer. We've been working it together as a band. I, really, I was put in contact with Jonas Reingold. Do you know oh, him? Yes, yes, mm, yeah. yes. So Jonas has become a great friend of mine, one of my best friends. And he um, he just moved to at that time he just only moved for, to uh, Vienna, mm-hmm. so I spent a lot of time in Vienna with him doing the vote to finishing the vocals and Mark and he was doing the mixing mixing doing the whole mixing and doing 
he was playing on it as well. He did uh, um, some of the guitar and and, and, and bass. Uh, maybe not the bass, but yeah, some bass on some of the tracks. He had a lot of input. We ended up again. Jeremy Carroll did the mastering. You know, we put a lot of time in, into these albums. A lot of I'm a bit I'm a bit anal when it comes to that. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> I know exactly what I want it to be, and you know, and that, that's yeah. And 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 anyway, we I'm never in a hurry to make it uh, to finish. I just want to do it, you know. And then uh, we um, so that album came out. And it's, I think it's a fantastic. Album, but again, people rave about that. Yeah, and uh, and and for the new album or a new album, I've written it already. I've already written it, um, hmm. I've written the basic tracks, and I wouldn't have to develop the tracks with the others. Yes, I'm deciding who to use. I'm definitely work, I'm been working with Jonas Schweingold on it. Great, uh, so I'm starting from an, another. Whereas we started on the with the most far, we started really on the harmonic side on the harmonies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the trust work was built out of the harmonies, I think. This will be built out more out of the music on the musical side. Wow. That's why I was why I'm working with like the idea of working with Jonas. Jonas is uh, also classically trained. All these guys are all classically trained. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's important to have those guys because they know how to structure. If you're talking prog music, it needs to be properly structured, it needs to join seamlessly. Yeah. And uh, that's, an, that's, a, that's an art form in itself, making that happen. So, but obviously, Jonas is also very busy because he's, he's touring currently with Flower Kings. Yes. Mm-hmm. And He's been touring with Steve Hacker. I saw the Palladium on the last night of their tour. Fantastic with a full a London Philharmonic Orchestra. It was yes. brilliant yeah. on stage. Fantastic. <laughs> so that was that was great. And uh, we'll start we'll start just working up working up the tracks with Jonas. Uh-huh. Then we'll decide who we're going to bring in. But I mean, obviously, I think for sure we'll, there'll be a Moon Safari influence for sure. And I think there'll be there some other uh, musicians as well, which were very famous musicians. Yeah, the yeah. other thing is, um, I was asked by the Indian Music Society to incorporate some tracks with two of the great Indian iconic masters, whose last four albums were I went to platinum. <laughs> oh gosh! Hmm. I think that would be interesting. Yeah, well, yeah. I could I could just about manage to do that. So, so I uh, so I, they will they, they'll be featured in on the album definitely. Wow. I've already started work on that. Fantastic. So, there are things. So I think uh, my plan. Is to get this album made in the new year and to get it out by in next year, yeah. and to do some do some more touring. Well, it's always pushing the boundaries. That's what we we like about uh, the sin. <laughs> and just before you go, it's been absolutely wonderful to talk to you, and we could carry on all night, but we do need to <laughs> need to call it today at some point. Just tell us how we can get hold of this reissued Sin Destructible. The best place to get it. It's very hard to get it in America. Yes, uh, as I know. <laughs> yeah. There aren't any to go there now. I think that's the problem. <laughs> but the best place to get it I, would be burningshreddeck.com. If you search, where it's to search for Sin, yeah. it will take you to uh, where you can buy it. It's indestructible. And it, I think it's the really, best price I've seen. And yeah. they, will, they are distributing it around the world. So it's, two, it's £21 from them. I think it was something like $60. I was trying to sell it in America. Mm-hmm. as an import and, then, and they'll say you can't get it for three months anyway so, <laughs> which means you'll never get it so, <laughs> so that, that's a good place Burning Shed is good Amazon.co.uk the UK Amazon and the interesting thing about them is actually you can bring them in from uh, from England to America you can order it and it's not too expensive right okay that sounds excellent okay now listen thank you very much indeed Steve it's been wonderful to speak to you and share all these stories about uh, our heroes and, and some of your heroes as well <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure for me. I thank you very much indeed. Yeah, Brilliant. thanks, Steve. Really appreciate it.